This is my largest rocket motor yet, Mega X, and its build was anything but straightforward. From the blast chamber flooding, more like a swimming pool than a blast chamber, to plastic wrap over electronics, to thrust numbers I did not expect. In today's video, I'll show you exactly how I built this motor, how we tested it, and what actually happened. <laughs> that was crazy. I've been working on Mega X for the past six months. It's designed to do around 500 pounds of thrust with a total impulse of over 5,000 newton seconds. This puts it well beyond anything I've ever tested before. My last motor, SN5, produced 96 pounds of thrust. To make this kind of thrust, a few months ago I casted around 9 pounds of propellant. Mega X uses rocket candy, which is a simple and relatively inexpensive propellant. If you're interested in how I casted this propellant, I have a full video breaking down that process. Although it's unlikely that this first iteration of Mega X will be reused, this motor itself is being designed with reuse in mind. Any part that I can reuse significantly reduces both cost and turnaround time for future tests. Right now, Mega X's hardware is made up of four main components. The nozzle, the nozzle insert, the bulkhead, and the casing. Before we can fully assemble this motor, there's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done on each of these parts. I'm going to start at the back of the motor by fitting the nozzle insert into the nozzle. Like I mentioned earlier, this nozzle is made up of two main parts. The nozzle itself, which is made from 6061 aluminum, and the nozzle insert, which is made of graphite. These two pieces fit very closely together, and I bond them using RTV silicone. RTV works well here because it can handle high temperatures while still providing a strong bond between the aluminum and graphite. I'd also like to thank Create Proto for providing me with these precision machine parts. I work with them to manufacture the nozzle and bulkhead for Mega X, and the quality and tolerances on these parts are exactly what a project like this needs. Honestly, these parts look so good. They are great to work with through the process, especially on components that require tight specs and clean finishes. If you're looking to get custom parts made, make sure you check out the link in the description. The graphite insert is used in areas of peak heating, which include the converging section, the throat, and part of the diverging section. This is the most demanding region of the entire motor. Graphite is a very common material for this area because it can withstand extreme temperatures. If the entire nozzle was made of aluminum, it would not hold up as well, as I've seen firsthand. One of my previous motors, SN4, effectively tested that limit. In the past, I've used stainless steel inserts, which do work. However, at this scale, stainless steel does not provide the same level of thermal protection as graphite, and it adds a significant amount of weight. Once the insert was bonded in place, I added a small amount of extra RTV to fill in a minor gap on the diverging side, then set a weight on top to let it cure. With the nozzle finished, the next step is one of the most critical parts of this entire motor. This is where I need to drill the radial bolt holes through the casing so the threads tie the casing into both the bulkhead and nozzle. This step is especially difficult because the holes for the bulkhead and nozzle are already drilled and threaded. That means every hole in the casing has to line up perfectly with those parts. To do that, I need to design a jig that would allow me to drill the holes in the casing accurately and consistently. In the past, I've had these jigs professionally made on expensive machines. But since I recently got a 3D printer, I decided to try to make them myself. That turned out way harder than expected. I ended up printing over 25 jigs. The biggest issue I ran into was getting the holes on the jig to be perfectly circular. On many of my early prints, the holes partially collapsed during printing and turned them into ovals, which wouldn't allow the correct size drill bit to pass through. I experimented with a lot of different print settings. Slow print speeds, fast print speeds, lower nozzle temperatures, higher nozzle temperatures, and a bunch of other combinations. None of these fully solved the problem. Eventually, I found a trick that a lot of people use to get accurate size holes on 3D prints. Instead of printing a perfect circular hole, the hole is designed with a slight teardrop shape. This stops the print from collapsing on itself and results in a true size hole once printed. After discovering that, I printed another jig and tested it on a smaller section of the casing. It worked perfectly. Once I confirmed that both the nozzle and bulkhead patterns lined up correctly, I printed the final jigs and drilled the actual holes in the casing. The jigs are also fairly thick. Since I'm not using a drill press, that thickness helps the drill bit stay perpendicular to the outside of the casing while drilling. After drilling the nozzle side, I added a small chamfer on both the inside and outside of the casing. This removes sharp edges. On my previous motors, I've had an o-ring tear because of the sharp corners left behind by the drill. Once I confirmed that the nozzle fit perfectly, I repeated this entire process for the bulkhead. 
During this step, I also sanded the outside of the casing. These aluminum tubes come from an industrial supplier, so they don't always look great when they arrive. The sanding helps smooth out small nicks and just makes the casing look a lot better overall. Now the last step before full assembly is adding the Mega X vinyl sticker. Now it's time to actually assemble this rocket motor. For this process, I start at the forward end of the motor. Before I install the bulkhead, I need to thread in the pressure transducer. This will give me pressure data inside of the motor during the burn. Once the transducer was fully threaded, I pack grease in it. This helps prevent the hot gases from directly hitting the pressure transducer and damaging it during the burn. I also add this small cardboard disc. This prevents the grease from leaking out before the motor is fired. After that, I install the bulkhead's O-rings. Both the bulkhead and nozzle use two O-rings, a primary seal and a backup seal. If both of these O-rings were to fail, the motor would be destroyed, so sealing it is extremely important. Specifically, these are FKM fluorocarbon O-rings. These O-rings are built to survive extreme temperatures. Once the O-rings are installed, I add a small amount of lubricant to help slide the bulkhead into the casing. These O-rings are thick and put a lot of outward force on the casing, so getting the bulkhead in takes some effort. With the bulkhead fully installed, I add 8 radial bolts. I also use plastic washers under the bolt heads, which prevents the bolts from digging into the soft aluminum casing when they're tightened. Once the forward end is secured, I slide in the propellant grain. For Mega X, the finisil orientation will be facing the aft end of the motor. This was my first attempt at casting a propellant this size, so it had a few imperfections. The coring rod did not want to come out smoothly, so I need to hit it with a hammer which added a bunch of little cracks into the propellant. Casting another grain at this size would take a bunch of time, so I decided just to use it. Cracks in the propellant will lead to higher chamber pressures, but I accounted for this. After that, I moved on to the nozzle. I installed the two o-rings on the nozzle, lubricated them, and then seeded the nozzle into the casing. Just like the bulkhead, the nozzle is secured using 8 radial bolts. Once everything was fully assembled, I added tape over the nozzle exit. This helps prevent moisture from getting inside of the motor, damaging the propellant before the test. Once the motor was fully assembled, the next step is integrating it into the test stand. I start by seating the motor into the motor adapter and then tightening down all eight alignment pins. These make sure the motor stays perfectly aligned during the test. After that, I install three thermocouples at specific locations on the casing. These will collect temperature data on the outside of the motor, which helps me learn about how reusable this design may be. To improve heat transfer, I'm using thermal paste between the casing and thermocouples, and then securing them in place with pipe clamps so they don't move during the burn. I also put together a metal braided rope to act as a leash just in case this motor ends up going rogue. To do this, I bought a piece of metal rope and on both ends I added a thimble and saddles to make a nice strong loop. One side will connect to the blast chamber wall and the other side will connect to the motor. Once that was done, it was time to install one of the most important parts of the motor, the igniter. To make this igniter, I use a modified e-match and form a small ball of propellant around it. Because of the size of the motor, I added additional wiring length so I can route the igniter leads all the way to the forward end of the motor. The igniter uses the same propellant as the motor itself, but with added aluminum powder to increase the burn temperature. I've tried several different igniter methods on my previous motors, and this approach has proven to be the safest and most reliable. Before installing it, I did a quick test fire of the igniter. This test igniter actually had more propellant than the one used in the motor, but I mainly wanted to confirm that everything worked as expected. Once the igniter was installed, I reapplied the tape over the nozzle exit. This is going to help build pressure slightly during ignition. If you're interested in how I built this test stand, I have a full video on that, so make sure you check that out. With everything integrated and secured, the motor is finally ready to be tested. We just opened up the test chamber and there's a lot of water. I just made a new cap for it, which I thought was going to work better, but that was about a foot of the water. So it's more like a swimming pool than a blast chamber. Unfortunately, due to a very high water table, water began flooding into the blast chamber. This was a serious problem. With water inside of the chamber, testing the motor was not possible. I was able to quickly locate the area that the water was leaking and patched it with epoxy water weld. That helped somewhat, but water was still seeping in from multiple different spots. At this point, it became less of completely stopping the water and more about how to manage it. So it is currently test day. It's got the heater running. This is gonna hopefully warm up everything, warm up the blast chamber. The water is still an issue, so I'm just trying to get it all out. It's only a little bit, and it only gets like this overnight. If I manage this and come out here and wring out the towels every two hours, it's fine. So I guess I'm gonna need to do that. I'm looking forward to a really good test. 
Because the humidity was extremely high, I needed to take extra steps to protect the electronics so they had a better chance of working. To do that, I added heat packs and silica gel packets and wrapped everything in plastic wrap. The goal was to keep the electronics warm and isolated from the outside air to prevent condensation from forming on the boards. On top of that, I also wrapped the boards in aluminum foil to retain as much heat as possible. This is just one more factor that made this test one of the most difficult tests I've ever done. Organized cables, fasten down secure. And then once all the test stand stuff's done, we got camera, set up cameras, take down canopy, start camera, start data logger, ignition, excitement is guaranteed. Everything up to this point took a significant amount of planning to make sure the test could happen safely and correctly. With about an hour before the static fire, we moved the test stand into position, connected the ignition cable and the safety cable, and bolted the whole thing down to the ground. At this point, all there was to do is turn on the cameras and press down the ignite button on the controller. Once the test was over, we pulled everything out of the blast chamber and removed the SD card from the Arduinos, starting with the thermocouple system. I honestly couldn't believe it, but the SD card wouldn't read. This sucked because setting up that system took a lot of work. Before the next test, I'll go back through the system and track down what the root cause of the failure was. Looking at the Arduino that handled the pressure transducer and load cell, I was very surprised at the thrust data. The maximum recorded thrust was 7,950 newtons. This is much higher than I expected, but I'm not completely shocked. Because of the cracks in the propellant, I knew the internal chamber pressure would be higher, which in turn would increase the thrust. When I checked the pressure data, the pressure transducer maxed out at 1,678 PSI. Unfortunately, this maxed out the pressure transducer, so we'll never know what the peak thrust was. This is exactly why I added additional radial bolts and strengthened the overall casing design for Mega X. If you want to see a deeper analysis of this data and a full teardown of the motor, stay tuned because that will be the next video in this series. In that video, we'll go through all the data in detail and learn a lot more about how this motor performed. Overall, I consider this test a major success for the first iteration of a rocket motor at this scale. Once all the analysis is complete, I'll move on and start designing and building Mega X version 2. Each iteration of Mega X will teach us more about this rocket motor and push us closer and closer to full reusability. There's still a lot more to come, so make sure you're subscribed. As I mentioned earlier, the next video will focus on tearing Mega X down after the static fire and going much more deep into the data. I also put out a poll a while ago, and a lot of you said that you were interested in seeing exactly how much this entire test campaign cost. I've tracked and documented every single expense for this project, and that video will come out after the Mega X analysis. Make sure to stay tuned for that one, because even I was pretty surprised at the final number. I also offer channel memberships where I post bi-weekly update videos and behind the scenes content. Memberships start at $1.99 and it's a great way to support these builds. And that wraps up everything with today's video. I really hope you guys enjoyed. Please subscribe, comment, and like, and I'll see you in the next one.